Hello, welcome to our time. Hello, nice to have Thank your you company good. once again. I love doing this program, do you? I do, but why well, do you love it? Well, I love it because we get to meet some most unusual people every week. And sometimes it's a, a personal story and oh. sometimes it's a... Um, a story about the wider community, and today we've got both. In fact, we've got all three, because we're going to find out a little bit about travel insurance too, if you're thinking of travelling. And um, over the last couple of months, there's certainly been a lot of issues around the world where travel insurance could be your lifesaver. Absolutely. To get you out. We also have... Mike Gemmell from the National Museum, uh, not the National Museum, the South no, Australian, Australian, South Australian South Museum. South Australian Museum. And Museum. he's talking about what happens if you've found something and you need to know a bit more about it. I didn't even know they had a service that you can take it in and find out. Michael, tell us about this. But talking about a personal story, were you ever on The Voice? Not that I can remember. No, I wasn't. The TV programme? Yes, no, 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 I wasn't. No. Because you're too old. I could Oh, I was I thinking think. about it, Mark. Are we? Yeah. I don't think they'd have people on. But um, our first guest of our age... <laughs> um, but our first guest has actually gone down that journey. Mm, lucky girl. Because she was Ricky Martin's protégé. Mm -hmm. Lucky girl. And she's with us right now. Thunderous clapping and warm welcome to the one and only... Dion Baker. Hello. Good, e <laughs> good evening. <laughs> no, it could be could be good morning. As well. Because we're all over morning. Australia at different Hello. times. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the program. Thank you. Um, just let's go back to the very beginning of you being a singer. Sure. How did it start? I started singing when I was about five. I used to mimic Jimmy Barnes. Um, oh, because you look so alive. <laughs> <laughs> so basically... I would listen to a Jimmy Barnes song and then a day later would know all the lyrics and would go back and sing it to mum and be like, I can sing Jimmy Barnes, as I used to call him when I was five. And then it kind of progressed into more of a pop vibe and I did my first sort of choir when I was 10. Right. So I was in the Festival of Music from the age of 10 to 12, which I thought was really cool. And then started singing classical at age 15. And you just discovered you had... That upper register of your voice, did um, you? Because Jimmy Barnes doesn't exactly sing in that no, register. No, no. He well, screams he's, more than anything. <laughs> he definitely screams. That's his warm-up technique. Yeah. Um, basically, I was singing with Danny Helps at high school at the time, and he'd given me a few kind of more left of centre songs like um, I Believe in Love and all that kind of thing. So they do were you? a little bit higher. Do you believe in love? Of course I believe in love. Is that why love. you're also having a baby? Yeah. Can we say you're having a baby? <laughs> well, you can. And you're close. Not too far off, are No, you? very, very close. close. Very close. Could you warm up the hot water and get the towels out, <laughs> just in case? Just now, in case. Now, life wasn't so easy for you to begin with, though, was it? No, unfortunately not. I was born with a congenital heart defect called Tetralogy of Fallows. It basically means that the blood and oxygen didn't flow properly through my my heart and it went through one vertebrae, uh, not vertebrae, ventricle. sorry, ventricle yeah. instead of the other one. Right. So basically, so is that I was basically a, blue baby. a hole in the heart in common speak? Um, not exactly. There are defects with holes, but I had three. Wow. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> now, the amazing thing is, though, that you've not that long ago had surgery for it. Yes, I've had quite a lot of surgery over time, but recent, my most recent one was probably about two years ago where I was quite ill and had to have three operations in 12 days. Whoa. Was that before and you did the voice or after the before. voice? Before. Before the voice. And was that in Melbourne you had the operations? Oh. No, here? that was all in South Australia. Right. Okay. Well, that's brilliant. So tell us what you <laughs> took away from being on a, a TV show with such a high profile. I took away a little bit more belief in myself. I'd come from a genre where... Not a lot of people make it because it's such a tight fitting genre and it's very cutthroat to be brutally honest. But I found that there are more genres out there that I can dabble in as well as doing the classical and opera as well. Because you've had some experience with that. We should have a look at you, um, some of the shots that happened during The Voice. So here's you in, in full, full sail. Yes, <laughs> look at that. And yeah. how gorgeous do you look? Lovely yeah, that's dress my favourite too. dress. Beautiful dress. What were you singing then? I sang Oh My Beloved Father from Gianni Skihi by oh. Puccini. Oh, right. Oh. And that's, of course, Ricky? Yep. 
and they were my two battle partners, Naomi Price and Tim McCallum. Uh, Naomi was the winner of that battle and Tim and I went home. Oh. Well, that's how it goes, isn't it? Sure I mean, is. So after all, it is a competition. That's right. That's my friend Simi, who is also an Adelaide-based performer. Very good singer, that, that fellow. Yeah. Lovely man. So, again, it's all about the voice because, of course, that's what the show is about. But how hard it is, is it now for you to move on from doing that? Because I know that you've just recorded this, which is um, your CD with some great... Can you... No. What's your eyes? Tell us some of the songs <laughs> on your new CD. <laughs> We're hopeless. There's the three that I did in The Voice. So there's Oh My Beloved Father, there's Somewhere from West Side Story, which I've done as a solo instead of a duet, and Climb Every Mountain from The Sound of Music. It's my favourite song. <laughs> we used to call it Mount Every Climber. Um, <laughs> so, now go so, um, so now, what's the next step in your life and career, apart from having a baby? The next step for me is developing my own one-woman show. Um, I'm currently in the process, the very, very early process of getting some stuff sorted with a friend of mine who is quite a very well-known director and will be hopefully performing that sometime next year. Great. Because that's really what you've got to do, don't you? You've got to use what's happened to you in a way and use the promotion, the publicity for that. Um, to launch the next stage. Definitely. How was Ricky Martin? <laughs> oh, okay. Changed the Mum subject slightly. <laughs> he was gorgeous. Was he? Easy to get along with? Yeah, yeah, really funny. Um, the only thing that he had difficulty with was our language being Australian. Yeah. He doesn't quite understand the Australian slang, so we had to kind of maybe change some of our wording so he could understand it a little better mm -hmm. because he speaks mostly Spanish to his children and his team. So he's got a bit of a language barrier, but he's a very kind-hearted gentleman. How did, um, how did he encourage you? What, what, was he, what did he give you with the, um, the whole program? He basically gave me more of an outlook at my, my own journey instead of just going, well, I'm not what people want because of my height and size. He's like, no, you've got to believe in yourself more and you've got to take these things away and use them to your advantage. Mm. So he's given me a bit more of an outlook that there are ways that I can progress with so my career. So confidence-wise, yeah. you feel that you have more confidence now? Definitely, definitely. How Good. tall are you? I'm four foot 11. <laughs> Huge. <laughs> Pint size, but no, dynamic. No. But, but he's absolutely right because we can look at the same looking type of people anywhere and everywhere every day. That's but right. it's the uniqueness of individuals that makes you special. And you're quite unique because you've got this amazing uh, register of your voice. Um, you've, got a, you've got this lovely sort of natural personality and now it's just a matter of letting an audience know your story, I think. Definitely. And I'm so, definitely ready to do that. So how hard was it to choose the numbers to go on yeah. the CD? Well, the songs that I picked were all sentimental. So for one reason or another, they meant something to me, whether one, for example, was, um, and this is my beloved, which is from Kismet. Mm -hmm. I chose that particular piece. For Andrew, your husband, right? Uh, no. No? No, oh, I actually okay. chose it as a bit of a dedication <laughs> to my late singing teacher, Belinda oh, okay. Matonti, because right. it was the first song that we'd ever performed together in a concert style um, Soiree, as she used to call them. Mm -hmm. So that That's was more of an ode to her. What? Well, <laughs> you know, I've just been thinking, where would I see, where would I see you? And I can see you in that. It's an old-fashioned word now. It's become more like a cabaret thing. Everyone talks cabaret, but the word soiree means something slightly different. Right. And you would fit that that mould in costuming, in 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 the choice of material, and so on. Because soiree was really like a well, apart from other things, it could be if you're a singer, like a bit of a gathering around a piano with, Pretty a much, with yeah. friends. Just well, I could join you in that one. Definitely. Cool. <laughs> You've had a few soirees in your time. I have had a few soirees. <laughs> Dion, um, so how can people um, find out where to get this? 
day. Do you have a website or I Facebook I do. Page? I have a Facebook page called Dion Baker Soprano. So that is my performance only page. I also have a Twitter account that I keep updated with any kind of performances that I'm doing. Fantastic. And you can also email me. Fantastic. Look, we seriously wish you the best for the future. And for the baby too. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's lovely. And it's a... What am I... My vibes are my <laughs> It's a... It's a baby. <laughs> All right. Uh, good Thank luck. You. And, and yeah. we're going to be back shortly to find out a bit more about travel insurance mm -hmm. that everybody needs to know. Yes. And also we're going to find out if you find something unusual or different uh, in the way of flora or fauna... What do you do with it? How do you find out um, what it is it. and more about yes. it? See you soon on Our Time. Welcome back. Welcome back to our time with yes. us looking now, Janice, at... Janice, if I was to show you some rocks with some little creatures in and say that they were older than you and me. <laughs> a lot, lot older than <laughs> you and me. Joined <laughs> together. It's our great pleasure to welcome from the Museum of South Australia, Mike Gimmel. Mike, welcome. Thank you. Mike, I cannot believe these rocks and the age of these rocks. <coughs> um, well, f first of all, where did these come from? They're from Kangaroo Island, from Emi, uh, a quarry that we have at Emi Bay. They're about 515 to 518 million years old, so they're more than twice as old as the oldest dinosaurs, and they're perfectly. They're older than you, then. <laughs> Thanks for that. They're perfectly preserved. They so they're little creatures that really um, ended up in the sediment of underwater. Yes, they li lived underwater. They're called trilobites, and they're the, among the first creatures that had legs that could crawl around looking for food. And the, the thing is, we often sort of think of museums as dry places of, you know, dead and whatever creatures. But when you realise how old this rock is and that creature mm. that you're holding in your hand, it's just, it puts life into perspective, doesn't it? It does tend to. And it gives you a really strange feeling when you crack a rock open and there is These little like things. Inside well, it. You're the first person to see that in how many years? Oh, a bit over half a billion Extraordinary, it's, isn't it? No, it's mind-blowing. Absol it absolutely is absolutely, absolutely. mind-blowing. If you're really and lucky, you find something that's never been found before. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's never been found before, <laughs> has it? <laughs> so let's have a look at where these actually came from because that's what's fascinating when you realise that we're living on this, on this great planet and in this country and these things are just literally under the ground. Where's this? It's over on Kangaroo Island on the north coast and uh, when we started that quarry, it looked... Very much like the uh, the brown and the green patch behind. Mm -hmm. We've been going there now for about eight years, and uh, we chip away with hammers and little chisels and brushes, and uh, extract material like that. Do, do the rocks? That's a question I've always wondered. Do the rocks split nicely for you, or could could in say this one here? Could there be many more inside yeah, of definitely. there? So Definitely. this could just be layer upon layer of these, yeah. say the name again. They're, they're trilobites. Trilobites. They're called a is the generic name oh, of Oh, please. This is a show that a lot of people are going to see. We can't use that sort of language here. Okay. I mean, <laughs> say that again. That's quite a mouthful to remember. Thanks. Bugs, <laughs> yes. I like that. <laughs> Um, but you, you, can't, you can't see this because um, you can't get close enough, but it's like little bones. It's like, you know, like you can see the ridges. Well, we've got, um, we've got things running around in our homes now um, that we don't want in our homes that are sort of similar, I suppose, I guess, with yeah. cockroaches and things like that. Well, the, these are... They look more like slaters than... than oh, slaters, yes, yes, that's yes. what I was... Oh, thank that's you, that's the word I was trying to remember, yeah. I couldn't. They're called um, trilobites because there are three lobes of the body. Right. Ah. Try, Try three, Try got that. <laughs> so we've got a few more pictures to show you of other places and oh, other creatures. little critter. That's a very cute little beetle that uh, we found up in the right up in the northwest corner of South Australia, up in the APY lands. And the point here is, it's not about just dead creatures; it's also about living creatures that you're involved with. No, we we, we find things, and then a lot of them haven't been identified, so uh, they're brought back to the museum, uh, and we look at all sorts of different parts of them. Quite often. 
they have to be dissected right down to their genitals. Right. To actually work out whether they are related to another oh, similar... Oh, OK. Or not. Because of the subtle changes mm. as evolution has occurred. Yeah. yeah. Extraordinary, yeah. isn't it? And uh, f leading on from that, um, two spiders, for, for example, a, uh, a redback spider and a huntsman spider, can never crossbreed. It just doesn't work because they're completely different. Uh, because they've species. split they're, somewhere in the spider they're, fraternity. They're, yeah, they're a different family even. Yeah, it's amazing. Different species. Yeah. So we've got some more photos here that are worth having a look at. <clears throat> um, you were saying before, or, or bef well, first of all, these this little cabinet is full of? That cabinet's full of material that uh, some of it's been in the museum's collection for a long time. There's a saber-toothed cat there and there's also... Uh, uh, a few fossils, some of which have been given to the museum, some of them have uh, come out of the museum's collections. And some people were trying to smuggle in. And that, that cabinet there is full of material that's come from the Australian Customs Service. People have bought things as souvenirs while they've been overseas. And uh, because they're made of parts of uh, protected species, it's illegal to bring them into the country. So they've been confiscated. You often wonder what happens to them, and, and these little critters here that are about the big one in the middle is <coughs> almost as wide as your hand. Yeah, that one's about uh, 80 or 90 millimetres wide, and they're some of the uh, well, less common wasps that we get around the place. The large one with orange wings there is a spider wasp. It uh, paralyses spiders, drags them back to its hole, but they're only partially paralysed and, and they're not dead. So if they come across a, an obstacle of some sort, They'll get around behind the the what the uh, spider and push it so it actually crawls over the obstacle. And once it's past the obstacle, the spider will, or the uh, the wasp will, will go on dragging it. How amazing! Takes it home for fresh food. Yeah. Well, when it gets back to its hole, it'll paralyse it completely, so it's still still alive. It'll then lay an egg on it and bury it in a chamber in the ground. Right. When the egg hatches, the larvae of the wasp then lives on the live spider. Life is extraordinary, isn't it? It's amazing. <laughs> That's incredible. It is. It's just fascinating. And now, they're in South Australia. Yes, those oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, we the, don't see them, though, do we? Um, occasionally you do. Well, let's see. I don't but know. quite often when people do see them, if they've never seen one before, they'll bring it into the museum saying that they've found this brand new species that's never been seen before and they want it named after themselves. <laughs> well, that's the other interesting right. thing because a lot of the things are named after perhaps the area, if it's not been seen before, the area it came from or... Quite often they are. The trilobites are named after Cape Lestang. They're called uh, Estangia, Estangia bilobata because they're, they're uh, a trilobite and that's where they came from. Okay. Yeah, see, that's really extraordinary. Now, we have a very special little... Um, creature here. I'll just put my feet up. No, that's all right. <laughs> we, and this, this one came from the Flinders Ranges, um, and uh, it is. Oh, he's moving about. A scorpion. Moving about. scorpion. And somewhere I've got a pair of tweezers, but I can't tell me where they are. So oh not... no, we don't need tweezers. <laughs> oh, oh he's he going to take it. Oh my. There you go. You can see him down there. Wow. You can yes. He's hanging on to that stick. Yeah. And if I put an ultraviolet light on it. It will fluoresce in ultraviolet light. Isn't that amazing? <gasps> now, all scorpions will do that. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Do and they move fast? <laughs> Just no, they're not very as, slow. Not as fast as you. <laughs> <laughs> Beware the sting in its tail, you know. But we don't have any dangerous scorpions in Australia. So oh, uh, it looks pretty mean. perfectly for the camera But those there, pinches on brilliant. the front would hurt. The, the, uh, it's the sting in the tail. It's it coming hurts. this way. <laughs> Uh, Janice, I'd... it's only a tiny little thing. Yes, it is. But... Come on. Home to Daddy. Come on. There you go. He's not home yet, though. Don't get too carried away. So some... did somebody find that and bring it to you, or is this your personal pet? <laughs> so this, this one lives in the Discovery Centre, mm -hmm. but it came from the Flinders Ranges. And, and the biggest one that, of those that I've seen was... From there long. to there. I'm glad you didn't bring that one in. So the the important thing here to, to remember for everybody who, who's basically watching us, that Mike works in the museum and is in charge of the department that can give you the information, go out, find stuff with you, for you, recognise what they are. People tend to find things all over the place. And uh, if the museum goes out looking for a specific thing, there's a good chance we won't find it because we're likely to be there at the wrong time or just... We might be on the other side of a, a track or the other side of a hill. Yeah. But um, people, when they're out 
bushwalking, working, um, just a normal, just doing their living their lives. Whatever. They come across, they come across things, and uh, these days most people have got a, a phone with a camera in it, so we get an enormous number of photographs of, of things come come in. Right. Mm. But uh, quite often we get objects brought in too, and and creatures. Mm. See, we didn't know this, but so Mike, if you could just stay with us for a minute, because we're going to find out if we are travelling around to discover these sort of things, why it's a good idea to have insurance. Mm. And here's Philip Stiles with our good mate Peter. Thanks for watching our time. Hope you're enjoying the program. I'm Peter Sellen, and with our with us at the moment is travel expert Philip Styles. Uh, lovely to see you again, Peter. Uh, great to be back again. And uh, the subject area, travel insurance. As they say, don't leave home without it. Uh, a very important part of particularly international mm. travelling. Uh, I, I think we hear horror stories from time to time of massive medical costs mm. in a range of destinations. And so my advice to people is please don't leave the planning of your travel insurance to the last moment. Do that as part of your travel plans and take out your policy at the time you make your travel commitments because you're covered then from the point of the policies being accepted mm -hmm. uh, to the point of time when you come home. Fine print, uh, obviously people often say, oh yes, yeah, it, 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 generally it's uncovered for everything, but there may be no, some pitfalls. Read the policy, make sure it's mm -hmm. suitable for your needs. Mm -hmm. uh, there are lots of people who say, I'm covered with my uh, credit card mm -hmm. insurance. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that can be okay. What's important to do is actually get the details of the policy. Read the policy, mm. make sure it's going to cover your particular circumstances. Don't ever believe that you can say, I don't, I don't really have a pre-existing mm. illness. Mm. Th that will come out if there is a major issue and it will be not to your advantage. I think it's important to, one, as I say, have the cover and two, make sure it's the right cover for you. It could be family, it could be uh, individual. Mm. Uh, there are aspects, are you going riding on motorcycles, mm -hmm. are you uh, going to be uh, surfing yes. near rocks, are you going to be jumping out of an aeroplane? Those are the sort of things that will have an impact on your policy and the right sort of cover for you. What about age? Does that have a, an impact on those? I think the best thing there is as you do get older, uh, there are by the age of 70, a requirement of a doctor's um, a form mm -hmm. to be completed mm -hmm. uh, that uh, may detail any of your pre-existing conditions or your current state of health. Uh, do that before you turn 70, right. if you can, yes. uh, because once the policy's taken, you could be having a birthday while you're away <laughs> and you're covered. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people would uh, just leave it up to their agent. Obviously, a lot of travel agents, if they're qualified, they're, they're quite responsible people. They will tell you the ins and outs and the pitfalls once you've determined where you're going. They'll determine the best policy mm. for you, and that's the, the key to it all, uh, get the right policy. And now, cost-wise, uh, what's involved? Well, there it's dependent very much on how long you're away mm. for mm. and quite often what parts of the world you're going sure. to and that influences the cost of medical care mm. in those locations. Mm. In some remote locations, Antarctica is one, you don't and cannot get out easily. No. And so there are a whole lot of uh, other circumstances yeah. that apply to the destination. The length of time, as I've said, uh, you're away will have an impact on it. Uh, but it's all relevant to what cover you're getting for the period of time you're away. So again, do your research, ask the experts and... Read the policy. <laughs> and you'll be safe. Hopefully. Absolutely. <laughs> Good on you. Stay, Stay safe. safe. Thank you, <laughs> Philip. Cheers. <laughs>
in, in my room, I never know what's going to come in the door. Mm. It could be literally anything. Mm. People find things down at the beach, up in the hills, mm -hmm. when they're out fishing, or they might find something in grandfather's shed that was brought back from the First World War. And you might even find um, Dion's CD that's eternally, it's called. Yes. So um, we'll put some information song. up on our Facebook page so that people and know where to get that. And we wish you all the best with that too. Thank you Absolutely. Very much. And please come back because I know uh, just recently you've had the result of um, an emblem for South Australia. Yes, it, we're looking at a, the South Australian fossil emblem. Okay. So we need to find out what that is. Please come back and join us one more time. Yes, Thank please you. do. And that goes for you too. So until we see you next time, please Take keep care. yourself nice till then. Yes, see you then. Bye for now. Bye.